couple of demonstrations on how this new cloud service for business intelligence can be used by developers. Uh, the integration, embedding, extending will cover all the developer scenarios. Uh, brief introduction of myself, I'm a business intelligence expert. I'm also a developer, but much more secondary. I work typically in data warehouse scenarios, all app solutions, reporting. Uh, and with Microsoft's new Power BI service, it's just a natural extension of the corporate and on-premises BI that I typically work with. Uh, I come all the way from Melbourne. And uh, in this session, um, I'll assume that you don't already have a background in Power BI. Probably some of you do. Uh, so we'll give you an overview of what it is. And I could spend 60 minutes alone just describing the, the full capabilities of what this service is designed to do. But really, the focus is on what can be achieved by the developer. So very quickly, I'll go from the 10,000 foot view right down to what's relevant for you to know as a developer. All right, well, I thought it might be good just to start with a demo up front. Um, I've already signed into the Power BI site. And um, just to let you know, this is free. Most of what I achieve in the session today could be achieved at no license cost, and I'll ensure that you're aware of what the license models are and what you do or don't get between the two, either the free Power BI license or the Power BI Pro license. At this stage, I've signed in, and I am going to commence by creating a dashboard. And the dashboard just will be NDC Sydney 2016. Um, and a dashboard, by definition, is simply a collection of tiles that can expose uh, different metrics, visualizations. And uh, when you think about when you drive a car, um, pretty much what you see is a dashboard that provides you key information. You don't want to be distracted by lots of unnecessary data. What is the fuel level? What speed am I going? And at a glance, you can gain an understanding of what's going on. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is add a tile that will be sourced from an image. And any web image will work here. So I'm just going to go to Google Images and do a search on NDC Sydney. And I think I like this one here. So I'm just going to copy the URL to the JPEG image. And switching back here, just paste it in. So this is the approach of adding a tile that is not based on data. There are seven different ways we can build out tiles on the dashboard. Uh, and these approaches to add images, text boxes, web content, or video are the non-data related ones. And I'm just going to resize this tile like this. Next thing we're going to do, and if you attended my machine learning session this morning, I would have asked you to participate in a survey. And I'm about to ask you as well. Let me show you how it's done. So I'm going to enter that, uh, yes, I'm male, and I'm around this age group, and I am a BI developer, and I come from Victoria, and yes, I've used Power BI before. And upon submitting the survey result, uh, the web application is shooting off an event to an Azure Event Hub. And pay attention here on the left, what was just added then was a new data set. So when we think about the foundational objects within Power BI, on the left-hand side, you see three categories of data sets, reports, and dashboards. The topic of data sets is quite vast. They can come from a variety of different on-prem, cloud, or as was just demonstrated here, a push approach that created a data set. And when I click on the data set, by default, it will create a new report and expose to me the data set in terms of a table named survey and a collection of fields. And I'm going to go ahead and add the submissions field to the report canvas. And you'll notice here it has an aggregation symbol next to it. It's a numeric field, so it supports the summarization through sum, min, max, count, average. And the default aggregation here is sum expressed as a chart, but I'll switch the visualization across to a card. So we can see so far one survey has been submitted. Um, I'd like to visualize the data also by location. So I'll drag location to the report canvas. As a text field, by default, it's going to create a table. But I'm going to switch that across to a map and say that the location is actually <coughs> location data. So there's my state of Victoria showing up. And I'll use the number of submissions to determine the size of the bubble. And I might also come in here and style this. The color could be improved beyond the default. So let's make that a nice blue to stand out. 
And there's a report creation from a data set. Let me go ahead and save it. And this will be my survey report. And once saved, I have the ability then to hover over the visuals and pin them to a dashboard. So the other approach to adding tiles to a dashboard can be existing visuals of a report. And I'll pin also the map. And then switching back to my dashboard, I can see the number of submissions and the location. All right, so laying out a dashboard. Those tiles can come from existing reports. They can come from other dashboards, as I'm now about to demonstrate. So here in my setup, I'm about to pin a couple of tiles that are going to provide you with the URL. And if you can, if you have a tablet, I would suggest you use the tablet for reasons that you will find out later in this. This is completely optional. None of the data that I'm collecting will be stored or used against you. All right, so let me just assemble this dashboard now by moving these into place. And just take a moment to fill in the questions as accurately as you care. And you'll watch real time your results appear in this dashboard. And I'm going to talk about how this actually works under the covers. Note that when you've submitted your survey, the thank you page says, please don't close this page. Later on, I'll get you to refresh it for another experience. OK, so a Queenslander. Two Queenslanders. More Queenslanders. Someone's submitting the same page multiple times. Curious. We've got an Afghanistani accountant in the room, do we? All right, 10. New Zealander. No Europeans in the room? So this is, in fact, one of two approaches to produce a real-time dashboard. This is using Azure Stream Analytics under the covers. So technically, there's no code. All right, the web app was pushing an event to an uh, Azure service bus. And then real-time, Azure Stream Analytics is just pulling each event off and pushing it straight through to the data set for real-time presentation here in a dashboard. All right, anyone still submitting? All right, so tiles. My first was basically a URL, non-data related. Just add an image. Uh, the next one was existing visuals from a report. I could pin other tiles from other dashboards. And then I could start to ask questions of the data. So up here is a feature called Q&A. So it would be, what else would I want to know about you? Um, age. It comes back and says, well, yep, the sum of age. That's not an appropriate summarization. So I say, well, go and give me the average age in this room is about 38.73. That's pretty cool. Let's pin that back to the dashboard. And then we might also ask for hmm, uh, roles by, oh, actually, role submissions. Order by submissions. Descending. So natural language querying and the way it translates into a query provides us a visualization upon which we can do things too, like format. You know, I'd rather see that that was that nice blue color. And also from a formatting point of view, let's add some data labels in there. And now that I like the look of that, so I can see 22 developers, a couple of BI developers, uh, pin that back to the dashboard as well. Uh, what else do we have? Gender submissions as donut. And there's just the one, I think, that was unsure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to put the data label on there. 
So both, so I can see one, one female, 26 male, I can pin this, and then it's easy enough to change. In fact, let me just show you that now that they're on the dashboard, and I'm gonna clean up by removing these URLs. I can start to lay this out in a way that makes sense for the finished report. When you click on a tile, it'll take you back to its source. In this case, clicking on submissions by gender, back to the question, and I can just change this and say, was there any prior use? And so I can see a 50-50 split on those that have versus those that haven't used Power BI. So let's pin that back as well. And ultimately, this is the dashboard that we could continue to monitor real time. All right, so that demonstration gives you a couple of things. The foundation and fundamentals around dashboards and how we bring in tiles from different sources, a real-time element in there as well, but also I'd hope to have shown you just how quickly, once your data's in place, these can be laid out and also without requiring a depth of expertise. Power BI has really been designed for a broad audience, not just data professionals, but really pushing out there to the average Joe that just needs to get data and make it available and useful um, for monitoring. So with that theory, let's jump into a quick overview of what Power BI is. Microsoft are marketing this as a new generation of BI. When I began my career working in data warehousing, cubes and reporting, we call that enterprise or corporate BI. That still exists. This is not a replacement for that. So data warehousing, enterprise solutions continue. But we saw a wave two come in whereby there was a need to deliver BI direct to users themselves. All right, because corporate BI cannot deliver 100% of a business requirements. If it attempted to do so, it would never get out of the gathering of requirements phase on the project. So ultimately, it has to strike a line in the sand and say, we're going to deliver here. And let's just use the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time, corporate BI can deliver the needs of the business, but the other 20% of the time, no. So what did Microsoft deliver several years ago now to enable self-service BI within the organization? Power Pivot, right, and then Power Query and Power View and a family of add-ins inside the familiar tool of Excel, enabling the business to produce, deploy, maintain, secure, and report off their own stores. And that's a successful story, but it requires still reasonably detailed or, or, or good knowledge. Power Pivot isn't something that the average user would just pick up. And that's where the third wave comes in. So now as a cloud service and quite a unique offering in the market, Power BI is there to enable typically any user to be able to connect to data, to lay it out in reports and express it through dashboard tiles. So enormous challenges delivering BI at any of those three levels. How do we get an end-to-end -end perspective across all of the data? And especially now that data resides not just on-prem but also in the cloud. Um, multiple data sources, data formats, big data, services, you name it, it's all out there, and trying to bring that together so we have the right data at the right time to the right people is an increasing challenge. And Power BI has been designed to uh, actually achieve that through a new cloud-based service. Key differentiators up front, um, there are pre-built content packs. So for example, Google Analytics is one of many available that I could just go to the Power BI service and I could say, get me some data. And then here under services, there's a growing number of services like you know, dynamic CRM. Uh, if we we're going to look at Google Analytics, I would just come down here, and usually they're in alphabetic order. Go and get data from here, and when I click get, of course you need to authenticate, so you would have the details on how to authenticate to your service. What it would deliver is a content pack existing of dashboards, reports, and within minutes, you can start interacting with your data. All right, so I won't demonstrate that right now, but that's the ease of use that this service has been designed to achieve. Next, real-time dashboards, and I've shown you one of two techniques. That technique was Azure Stream Analytics pushing um, streaming results into Power BI. There's the ability also to connect to live data sources, be them on-prem via a gateway. So that could be uh, SQL, Oracle, Teradata on-prem via a gateway. We could report and analyze them direct through the Power BI service. Uh, there's also the ability to connect to cloud services, so Azure SQL Database and so on. 
Intuitive data exploration, so the questions that I asked of the dashboard is the feature of Q&A, responding with visuals that you may pin back to dashboards, integration with other Microsoft products. My last demo was Stream Analytics, pushing data into Power BI. And then lastly, fast deployment, hybrid configuration, gateways, et cetera. This is a very, very brief, high-level discussion. So when we talk about data sources, there's a vast um, array of different formats, on-prem cloud sources that you can access. Ultimately, they will arrive in your workspace as a data set. So when we talk of data sets, you need more detail. How is that data set arriving? Where is the data? Is it being pushed? Is it being pulled through a refresh process? Uh, then we lay out through dashboards and reports. There's a whole story then on sharing and collaboration. So we can share within the organizations through various techniques. There's also mobile delivery. On top of this, when it comes to producing rich modeling and reporting, there's the Power BI desktop as a free download and companion application to the service. It's designed to let you retrieve data results, relate them, enrich them with calculations, express them through reports, and as a single file, you'll publish it to the service that will deliver a data set and reports, and then you may pin the visuals to express them as dashboard tiles. To keep the data current, either work direct with cloud services or install a gateway and enable a refresh to take place on a periodic basis. Lastly, to complete the picture, there's a REST API that allows developers to interact, to push data, to manipulate data set definitions, and also to embed reports and dashboard tiles into your own applications. Are there any questions about what Power BI is at this stage? So half of you had confessed that you hadn't used it before. Any questions at this stage? Are we still on the free section? Well, talking about licensing. Um, yes, everything that I've done so far, actually, no, I, I lie because the stream analytics. Actually, no, you could do that for free. Everything I've done so far, you could achieve with no cost. So two licenses, the Power BI license, which provides free capabilities, or the Power BI Pro, which comes in at $10 US per user per month. Be aware that if you sign up for Power BI, you can also ask for a 60-day free trial of the Pro features. All right, at that point, after 60 days, they will take it off you, and if you need it, you will need to start paying. Um, at the end of this session, I'll actually provide you a list of what you can or can't do with the license models that are relevant to the topic. An additional question. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I know that I have customers in the education space and they get discounts. So that's a conversation you'll have with your account manager. Um, volume counts. All right. So if I was to talk about Power BI and all of the capabilities, and this time grouping them by role within the organization, uh, we would see there's different features um, that would appeal to different uh, groups of users. We're really here to focus on the last group, and that is for developers. How can you express data as real time through dashboard updates? How can you integrate Power BI into applications? And how could you extend the 24 visuals that are already available with your own custom visuals? All right, so Power BI for developers. Let's start with the discussion of what you can do. So I would suggest there are four very exciting opportunities to allow you to integrate, embed, and extend the Power BI experience. The first topic we'll cover is the REST API. Uh, integration with Azure services, we'll talk in a little detail. I'll go through custom visuals and what you can achieve. And then finally, and the newest offering is a new Azure service, Power BI Embedded, only recently released out of preview, enabling you as application developers to integrate reporting into the application experience directly. And I'll demo this one at the end of this session. So with a focus then on the Power BI REST API, there's various things you can achieve with the API. Uh, the first is that you can push data directly into an app, uh, uh, from an app into the Power BI data set. So essentially, that's what Stream Analytics is doing under the cover. Every Stream Analytic query is actually pushing rows into the data set using the exact API that you can use as a developer. You can also integrate reports into an application. The dashboard tiles that I've added to a dashboard may also be integrated into an app. When you push data 
using the API, uh, the results will deliver real-time updates as you've already witnessed. So no more waiting, no need to press F5. Can you imagine perhaps in your server room you have a monitor with an unattended dashboard just updating as and when the data is being pushed to it? All right, so a little background about the object model hierarchy. Uh, when you sign up for Power BI, it actually is an Office 365 tenant under the covers. So there may already be one there. In fact, the very first user within your org that signs up for Power BI, if there isn't already a Power BI established, it will be created automatically. And then as other users within the domain uh, sign up as well, um, you're basically working within the same environment. It enables you to share amongst other users within the organization. Uh, but each individual user gets a private or a personal workspace. And we see evidence of this here, that when I return to my workspace, what you see in the navigation pane on the left is my personal workspace. As a pro feature, for example, you can create groups. And a group is a workspace that's owned by nobody except a membership, and that membership can come and go. And so if you do need to collaborate and work collectively on data sets, reports, and dashboards, please do not create them in your personal workspace because you cannot, at this stage, move them to another workspace. But that real-time dashboard, if I needed others to manage it, or perhaps when I leave the organization, other people need to take ownership and manage it, then it should have been created in a group. This is a pro feature. Within the workspace, then, whether it's a personal workspace or a group workspace, structurally they're identical, you have a collection of data sets. Data sets have collections of tables, and tables have collections of fields, and within these, we have rows of data. In order to work with the REST API, you need to register an application. And then you will grant it privileges, and then that application or a client ID would be used to authenticate all calls that are made when using the REST API. So in this demo, I am going to sign out sign back into Power BI by using another account. I just don't want to create an app on my personal account. So I've just signed into, well, not quite. Yes, I've just signed in by using another tenant, and I have full admin rights on this tenant. We'll see that it has new data within its workspace. And then what I'm going to do is navigate to the Power BI app registration tool. So this is a requirement. You do need a client ID. Um, I'm going to sign in with my existing account. Let's just see it's not confused which account I'm using. That's unclear to me. Urgh. Yes, I want to make absolutely sure, because I've messed up my own account by creating too many apps in it. So it's this one here. So it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, the decisions you need to make will be, well, what is the name for this? Power BI NDC Sydney Demo. Sounds pretty good to me. Is it a web app or is it a client app? Uh, a redirect URI is required for the authentication process. So what I'm going to do is, in demo number one, I have some snippets here, and I'm just going to use this redirect URI. And then I need to grant privileges for that app. So can it read the data sets? Can it read or write to the data sets? Well, that's required for pushing. Um, in preview, we have the ability to read dashboards and reports. That would allow you to enumerate the items and to uh, obtain the GUID that uniquely identifies it. If you're going to embed reports or dashboard tiles in apps, this is the programmatic way that you may explore and retrieve the GUIDs that you'll need to use. The ability to read groups allows you then to enumerate through groups and the workspace objects within those groups. And so I'm going to grant all privileges and simply register the app. And that will provide me with this GUID. All right, so the next thing will be I'm going to run this Explorer application. 
So I've built this really just to demo how the API works. You wouldn't build an app that does what I'm about to show. I'm going to open up and just put a, uh, a breakpoint. In fact, I'll enable the breakpoints that I already have. And I'm going to step through just a little bit of code. And that will be how the token is retrieved. And essentially what the app will do is once it authenticates, it's going to store a token in a variable. And then every request we make uh, is going to have to add that as a token to the header of the request. All right, so the way that it works is this. I'm going to run the app. And ordinarily, you would not have options like this, but it wants to know your client ID. And they would be stored in a config file. Uh, and also the redirect URI. The other URIs are fixed. They're basically the endpoint for the Power BI service itself. So now that I've satisfied that requirement, the application needs to authenticate. And here it is stepping through my method to get an access token. So providing that a token hasn't already been retrieved, it just runs through these steps, which then launches an interface like this. So I was admin at online labs 12.onmicrosoft.com. And it just says to me, well, it's got these permissions. Do you accept this? And now that I have, it should issue a token which is encased in a variable with the application. All right, so I'm not going to go through any more stepping through code. So let's disable all breakpoints and continue on. So we can see in the console here, and perhaps it's not so clear with the size of screen in this room, but it provides me some feedback to say, yep, I got an access token, it's now been cached, and it's available for reuse. And what it shows me here in the Explorer pane is that I have a user workspace. We have collections of data sets and dashboards. So if I right click and say, well, go and get the data sets, what it's calling is a method here with the get request, basically saying enumerate data sets of which there are presently none. And that could be confirmed easily by the fact that when I look at my workspace, I have nothing here at this stage. So what I'm going to demonstrate is the creation of a data set. Right click, create data set. And this experience that I built would allow me to enter a JSON document that describes a data set in terms of the tables and columns and column types. Uh, so I'm just going to paste in this JSON here. All right, so the data set has a name, e-commerce operations. It has a collection of tables, of which there is one. The table name is product browsing. It has a collection of columns, and you can see the columns in terms of their names and their data types. So this one's very simple. Product, product category, and country. Now, when creating a data set, the other consideration is the default retention policy, which by none says you'll just keep filling it until you reach the maximum, which is 5 million rows, and then you would need to explicitly clear it. Perhaps more interesting is the basic FIFO that says to an accumulation of 200,000 rows, um, it'll just keep rolling over. So when the 200,000th and 1th row is added, the very first row will be dropped off, and you'll always have 200 rows moving forward. So let me choose that option, and then by clicking OK, and watch here on the left-hand side. When it pushes through that request, It'll respond instantly in my workspace with the e-commerce operations right here. And upon selection, as you learned earlier, when I select a data set, the default behavior is to create a new report based on the data set. And here we see evidence of the data set through the collection of fields. Of course, at this stage, there's no data. But let me just drag product out. And the default behavior for a string field is it's going to create a table of which you can just see the column header, but of course, no data. But what I'll do is switch this across to the card. And then you'll see here that the default aggregation that it can only use for text is to either count it or count distinct text values. All right, so we have nothing. And then I'm going to save the report. And I'll call this product browsing. 
and then I'm going to pin it to a dashboard. Well, a dashboard doesn't exist yet, but that's cool because I can create a new dashboard at the same time. Product browsing. And there we have the dashboard with nothing. Okay, well, let's fix that. Now that I have a tables collection, there is an API method to enumerate all tables. So the get tables tells me there's a table called product browsing. When I hover over it, you'll see the table is just described in terms of a name, whereas a data set is described in terms of a GUID and a name. By right clicking the table, what I can do is update the schema. I can't think of a lot of use cases for this, but if you do need to add a new column, you can push through a JSON document that describes the new structure of the table. Uh, we can clear all rows, that could be handy, or when we push data, um, the application is using the same method, which is just add row to table. I've got a method that allows me to copy a valid JSON document like this. So a collection of rows of which I have just the one. And so watch this, when I push this, you'll see the dashboard tile update immediately. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. Create tables, push rows in. The other method is just automating the push to show you what an event stream could look like. <coughs> so it just so happens I have a stored procedure that has exactly those three columns that will be returned in a result set. And I'm just going to push 10 rows and delay a second just to sort of simulate you know, a real workload. And at this point, we have a data set within the workspace, and we could start asking questions like, um, what is it, category. And it shows me the categories um, and counter products. There we go. That's what I want to see. Let's pin that. And that, too, is updating real time. And that's pretty much all there is to producing real-time dashboards. And the consideration is, of course, we need real-time data. But it could also be a scenario that despite Power BI's quite large range of data sources that it can access, there might be data sources that are not supported. So what that leaves you is the option to push data rather than it pull data. Any questions about the REST API and pushing data? It's something that I've written. Uh, so the question is, yeah, where did it come from? So Microsoft engaged me to produce the educational or technical educational content for Power BI, and that's one of the 10 labs that I built for them. Uh, we're in fact building this out as a one-day course for developers. Actually, that's not official at this stage, but I've been asked to put together a one-day program, uh, and that will be content that would be available for download through GitHub as part of that content. Mm. Question. No, absolutely not. The API only works with the service. It's pushing to a data set within a workspace, and that's all cloud-based. Correct. So my customers would need to know that that data is going to be in the cloud. You do have a say in the data centers, so here in Australia. Um, we could be assured that it will be an Australian data center that would host that, but it is cloud-stored. Now, if it needed to remain on-prem, your app could just push to a SQL database, and there is the ability through Power BI, through gateways, to provide real-time connections. That won't give you a real-time update in the dashboard. The dashboard tiles that are based on a data set that uses an on-prem SQL um, will refresh approximately every 15 minutes. All right, so it's not real-time. Uh, you, no, so there's no refresh call. What you can do is schedule refresh. So it depends. We've got two different approaches for certain data sources, and let's talk about SQL Server on-prem. There's what we call Direct Connect that says it's not actually caching data. Periodically, it just queries, or according to interactivity in a report, they're live queries. As I filter on Australia, a live query is sent via the gateway, pushes the data back. But for dashboard tiles, they would update approximately every 15 minutes. Okay, you could not force that refresh. Um, if it's using a cached approach, whereby 
you want it to pull the data from on-prem and cache it within the service. You could also do that with SQL Server via the gateway, and at best, you could refresh that eight times a day on the pro license or once a day on the free license. So it just depends on your requirements and your licensing, all right? But the benefit here and the story for developers is you can push as and when you're ready, and that's the control of your application. Another question in the back of the room. So rollup systems, uh, you're talking about analysis services cubes in rollup. So uh, also the same story with SQL Server is the on-prem analysis services can be delivered via a gateway and that could be a pull situation where it's cached in the cloud, but far better when you have large sets of data, which typically a rollup cube would be, that you have a direct connect scenario. And as and when a user interacts with reports, it just queries analysis services on-prem live. And if they're dashboard tiles, they'll approximately update every 15 minutes. Uh, do we have to define the data mesh in the for that uh, you, will need to, you will need to make this work by installing a gateway on-premises uh, and then allowing users permission to work with that gateway. All right, so it's a little out of scope from what we're talking here. Come see me offline and I can give you some more detail about it. But it's a fairly straightforward scenario for Power BI in a hybrid configuration of on-prem data available through the service itself. One more question before I move on. Yes, so from a point of view of sharing, so what you said isn't necessarily true. What I've just achieved for that API call there, I could do for free. 10,000 rows an hour for free, Microsoft will give every user, which I think is pretty generous. All right, when it comes to sharing that, there are techniques like sharing dashboards, um, and that's it for free. If they're on a pro license, there's org content packs that allow them to publish content within the org. Uh, there's also the ability for them to use groups, which is a pro feature. Uh, another feature I'll talk about is embedding. So there's an embed of reports that is available to the public, and I'll demonstrate that one shortly. So the story of sharing is, is quite complex because there's, there's different techniques that suit different scenarios. So let's just leave the message that, yes, generally speaking, you can share this easily within the org and possibly outside the org. All right. Uh, I won't go through the flow of communication that takes place for authentication, it's all documented, but depending on whether it's a client app or a web app, there's gonna be different flows. Uh, you just need to program accordingly. And there are GitHub projects that you can then kickstart your own development. When it comes to all of the methods, I've talked about most of them. List data sets, create data set, list tables, update schema of table, push row to table, clear all rows in a table. Did I show you that one? Probably not, but that's pretty straightforward. Right click, clear all rows. So if you met that five million total, if you weren't using the basic FIFO mode, um, you might periodically need to clear out. Maybe every 24 hours you'd have a job that just says clear. All right, uh, what else you can do is you can list groups and then you can enumerate objects within a group that you have ownership of. Listing dashboards, tiles, and reports allows you to retrieve GUIDs that you may then use in embedding scenarios. So I won't demonstrate this, but if that dashboard tile needs to be in your web app as well, you can do this. You'll need to authenticate, get a token, then call via the GUID to embed that tile. There are some new other ones in preview that allow you uploading a Power BI desktop file programmatically to create a data set and reports. Um, there's also the ability to change connection string details to point to different uh, databases using different credentials. And there's a new one in preview I just noticed this week, creating a data set and a very rich definition, multiple tables, relationships. So um, what you can achieve through the Power BI desktop file, creating a rich model can now be done programmatically in preview. So it shows you the direction this is heading. You can bring in multiple tables, relate them, add calculation logic as well, and push this programmatically to the service. So stay tuned on that. What happens under the covers? Listing data sets. Essentially, here is a get request. Uh, having authenticated, your token will be added to the header, and then the response will come back looking something like this in JSON, and then you just do something with it. Uh, when it comes to adding a row to a table, um, you will need to retrieve the GUID for your data set, and then you can see tables, and then the name of your table, and then push to the rows. And essentially, you'll have a valid JSON document that one or more rows would be inserted into that table. 
All right, that was my demonstration on a real-time dashboard with the Power BI REST API. Be aware that there are some restrictions. So the maximum number of rows in a single push would be 10,000. So a single JSON document, comma separate, up to 10,000. Uh, when it comes to ingestion for the Power BI license that is free, you're given 10,000 rows an hour. If you're on the pro license, it'll support up to a million rows an hour in a push. Maximum rows per table, five million. Unless you're in the basic FIFO, that is 200,000 rows and rolling forward. And the maximum pending requests will be five. So if they're queuing up, um, it'll error if it has more than five in queue. I've not encountered that error yet. Moving into stories with the um, Azure ecosystem. So you'll see a growing story coming from Microsoft. In fact, Cortana Intelligence Suite puts Power BI as the presentation layer on top. You know, it's a service bus, event hubs, data warehouse, lakes, big data. It's all coming together. Uh, what we could describe is that you can connect to Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and to HD Insight Spark. And you can build reports and dashboards direct off these. Uh, and they won't be real time, but they will update perhaps every 15 minutes automatically without you needing to do anything. The story with Stream Analytics is my opening demonstration. And so this allows you then to ingest from an enormous number of sources, of which I've used events on a service bus event hub. And then the Stream Analytics is just running a Stream Analytics query. And it has many places that it can output the result to, of which Power BI is just one of them. All right, there is a restriction here, and it says that your Azure subscription must be in the same org as the Power BI. And that's why I'm switching accounts here. I have to use my company's subscription to push to uh, my personal Power BI account. Um, what I'll show you in demo here then is using the old portal. Here I have a Stream Analytics job running, and I can show you that its input is bringing in from an event hub, which we can see here, and it's outputting to Power BI. Now, when I created the output here, it asked me to authenticate, and I put my Power BI credentials in there, and they are stored. Every 90 days, I would need to come back and redo that because the token has a 90-day lifetime. What goes on in the middle is the query itself. And if you're familiar with T-SQL, um, the Stream Analytics language is near identical. And uh, essentially, what it's doing is just selecting the field names. So what's been pushed to the event hub is just a JSON document. You know, role is BI developer, age is blah. And uh, here it is just querying from the input that is reading from the event hub. And here it is pushing to the output that is the Power BI output. This is not a good example of stream analytics. What should be here is a group by, and in that group by should be a function like tumbling window. So a tumbling window of five seconds, for example, would say all of the events coming in, so all of my devices and sensors collecting temperature, and it could ingest millions of events a second. That's if you want to scale Azure to do this. What this query would do every 10 seconds or five seconds is just aggregate across and produce me the average temperature per device and push it out to Power BI every five seconds, and then you could have real-time representation. So it really does belong to an IoT story. There is no group by here. Basically, every input coming from you guys when you submitted your survey resulted in a row being pushed through. The reason I did this in demo, it's just easier than building authentication logic with the REST API into a web app. All right, if I could just get an event hub or an event written to an event hub, then this is just easy to do. That is the demonstration on using Azure Stream Analytics. Next story, moving to the extension of the current 24 visuals that you already have. So Microsoft rewrote their reporting engine. Um, we had Power View. In the, uh, in the prior release. Does anyone know why Microsoft are no longer developing PowerView? Even more, if you go to Office 2016, in Excel, it's sort of hidden from you. It's available, but you need to customize the ribbon to bring back the functionality to insert a PowerView sheet. Why are Microsoft sort of hiding away from this? What technology is PowerView using? Mm. So, with Silverlight working Chrome, Safari, Firefox? No. 
So when it came to wide adoption of their self-service BI tool, it would only work in Internet Explorer. So a complete rewrite of the reporting engine and uh, of HTML5, and basically working in any modern browser. Now, the next thing they did, having developed 24 new stylish visuals, um, they then put them on GitHub and said, our source code's available for you guys to understand, and you may extend by adding your own custom visuals. So learn from what we've done and build what suits your direct purpose. If you feel generous, share it with others. There's a public gallery, or keep it in-house and use them for your own reports and dashboards. So when you visit the visuals gallery, you'll see a growing number of some cool and some crazy custom visuals. Let's take a look. All right, so here they all are. And basically, I'd recommend you just download and try. So I'm going to use the crazy one, Enlightened Aquarium. And it's just a matter of agreeing to terms, essentially saying that Microsoft have no responsibility whatsoever for what might happen if you use their visual. And I've already downloaded it in case the internet went crazy on me. So I won't download it again. There's two approaches. In Power BI Desktop, I could add it there, or I could in the service itself. So let me sign out of here, sign back in. Let's return to your survey results. And I'd like to you know, see a more interesting visualization of the different roles that I have in this room. So I'm going to return to the report, which by default is in read mode. I'm going to switch to edit mode. Uh, and you'll see a dot, dot, dot here, allowing me to import a custom visual file, whether I downloaded it or developed it in-house. So let's bring the aquarium in. And as simple as that, I can just click it. It adds it into my report. And let's show the aquarium in terms of the roles that you told me about yourself. And the number of submissions would give me the fish size. All right, so I guess if you work in an aquarium business or a fish and chip shop, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and save it, and we can pin this also to our real-time dashboard. So now we have this. OK, how cool is that? All right, so it's really now up to your creativity to start expressing your data. All right, I should point out also that they're completely interactive. So for example, back here, if I say, well, there's your 38, 38 software developers. If I click on it, you know, I can then cross filter and see the countries from which you've come from. All right, so we've got someone from here. By the way, did you notice the gender had a third choice? Let's put a page filter on here. If I filter out those that uh, I only want to see female and male. Yeah, that cleansed the data. Do you know that we do that deliberately in statistics? We put questions that we know that if someone answers them, and no disrespect if you don't know your gender, but if you choose that, there's a high likelihood that your other responses are not good either. So here, by filtering them out, I get some sensible res responses. Is that right? So for whoever created all those locations, I know your trick. Uh, what do we got? There's 28 unsure. Mm, it doesn't lie. It might be a little bit out of date, and I might need to refresh it. But that's definitely the current data that's within the data set. Alrighty, that's the story of custom visuals. Uh, go ahead, download the GitHub project, learn from what Microsoft have done to produce their own visuals, and extend with your own creative insights. Um, I've never developed one. What is the 3D? What is it? D3, thank you. I've never developed one, but yes, that's what they're developed in. Uh, other story, this really isn't a dev story, but for completeness, I want to include it. Um, there's the ability to take reports and publish them to the web. This is not a dev story, because as I'll show you, there's no code, and anybody could do this. So if I go ahead and just save this report, I can produce an embed code as simple as this. But you need to be aware that this is available to anyone on the internet. And you'd want to be very, very careful with the data that you publish, right? So it creates this embed code. Let's uh, increase the size 
I'm just going to copy this. And if I switch across to the thank you page, what I'm going to do is paste that embed code. If you would like to, in just a moment, just let that publish. If you go ahead and reload that last page of the survey, so still wait for it to publish, um, you'll see how simple it is to embed that report. This will be much more effective if you're on a tablet or a desktop, and that's completely interactive within your device. You'll note that there's a little maximize icon that will fill the screen. I don't know how it works on a phone, but how simple is this to start sharing? your reports and data, and this is available in all licenses of Power BI. I think that's incredibly um, generous of Microsoft. If you've got data you'd like to share on your blog, it's just a matter of pasting this frame in. Okay? So not strictly a dev topic, but I thought it might appeal to you. That's published to web. We come to the last topic. I'm just going to focus on time. Do I really only have eight minutes? The new service that allows us to embed Power BI for application purposes. It's a distinctly different role for Power BI here. Everything that I've described so far is talking about individual workspace or a group workspace for collaboration within the org. But now we've got the concept that you can create a workspace that's dedicated for the purpose of an application. Your app needs rich reporting, interactive reporting driven from your data. Rather than develop, you know, reports by code or wherever, we can now just embed reports direct from the service. All right, so I think what I want to do is just say, sure, high level, we can create reports, we can embed them into apps and deploy them with ease. Uh, and there's some key attributes, but I just want to get straight into the demo because time is against me. Uh, what I'm going to do is switch to a Power BI desktop file here. This is on the desktop. Uh, the Power BI desktop is developed a model consisting of three tables, product, sales, state, and it's expressed it through a couple of pages. So a report can be one or more pages. This is presenting data. So when I filter here by calendar year 2015 or 2016, this is hitting an Azure SQL database. All right, so it's using a technique called direct query. Now, my intention is to just go ahead and save this close the Power BI desktop file, and now as a developer, I'm going to switch to the new Azure portal, and I'll just show you that the database that it's using is Tailspin Toys US, an Azure SQL database, and I'm going to provision a Power BI workspace. Oops. No. In my current NDC Sydney resource group, I'm going to add Power BI. So as a new service, it just went live weeks ago. I'm going to create this. And essentially, it's a collection of workspaces. So I've talked about workspaces that are individual workspaces. Here is an application-owned collection of workspaces. Create. And as a collection, you can create as many workspaces as you need. Typically, I would guess one per application. Or you might use different security boundaries or driven by customers and partition, depending on the customers and users that you have. All right, is that creating? Deploying. While it's doing that, I'm gonna switch across and open up a GitHub all right, so everything you need to get started is available to you here. Let me show you how it works. Let me copy this and then clone this. what you'll find is that you end up with a couple of projects here. So this is where it comes to, uh, you need an app to embed into. There we go. And you need to work with the REST API because you need to upload that Power BI desktop file. You need to update the credentials because uh, stored credentials will not flow. 
you need to reapply them. And so what we're going to do is, first of all, run the provision sample. So this is just a utility that is using the REST API. So it's no different, in a sense, to the workspaces within your org. It's just a workspace hosted within Azure. And what it says to me here is that I've got various options, and I know that's small for you guys to read. Option five allows me to create a new workspace. So what I need to do is switch back here and see that that was provisioned. And now that it's been provisioned, I need to come back to my resource group, refresh, and how I have a workspace collection. The blade for it tells me that I currently have no workspaces. And there's no ability through the portal at this stage anyway to create a workspace. So what I do need to do is to get the access key for the collection and then come back here and use option five. What is the workspace collection name? NDC Sydney. What is the access key? And using the API, it creates a workspace. And a workspace is identified through a GUID. You can see that returned here. Um, I wish there was a refresh command here, but there isn't. But when I refresh, we'll see the blade tells me that I have a new workspace. And within that workspace, I can have data sets, reports, et cetera. And there it is, and identified through this GUID here. Number six says, what is the name of your data set? Let's call it sales analysis. Uh, what is the file path to it? And this is going to use the upload method to push this Power BI desktop file. That's available as a method also for you to use on your own workspaces. I'd like to push the Power BI desktop file up so it's now stored in a workspace in Azure. The last thing then is to update the connection string. So the username I know will be Peter, and I'll apply the password. I don't need to provide a connection string because it hasn't changed, and now the API is updating the connection details, so it is now pointing at the Azure SQL database. That is all now done. So the second project within that solution is an embed app. So let's switch this across to the startup. Come to the web.config, and I need to fill in some values. So what is the access key? That was that. Workspace collection was NDC Sydney, and the workspace ID was this one here. And that is all it needs to know how to embed. So I'll run the app. It looks like a real app, but really isn't. You'll see. So we'll assume that your user has logged in. And so the other things that I won't share with you here, because I don't have time, is that you can control through um, access tokens what users have rights to what reports. You can also apply custom filters, that this is a user from Australia, therefore filter the reports by Australia. So we'll assume that Emily has signed in, and when she comes to the reports, we see that that data set uploaded, named Sales Analysis, is here. And when we click on it, there's the embedded interactive report running against live data in Azure SQL. All right, so you've got the full functionality of what you can achieve with Power BI Desktop. And then the interaction with this is live data. Key attributes, easily author interactive compelling reporting using the Power BI Desktop application. Choose modern visuals out of the box or the custom visuals that you develop will work here also. Easily embed interactive visuals and use the REST API. Ensure consistent high vitality data experiences on any device, so tablet, phone, desktop, browser. Use your existing authentication and authorization methods within your app itself, all right? Speed up time to value without redesigning your existing app. Just start embedding new visuals based on the data that the app is using. And then from a payment point of view, this gets quite interesting. So originally they had said, 
um, you will pay per render, which is a little interesting because the renders here would mean that when I filter by 2016, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven renders within one filter change. And then when I say, ooh, what's going on in California, and I click California, and I click California, it's cross-filtering to the others. So very quickly, these renders build up. And so um, based on feedback in preview, they've said, all right, we're going to charge you five cents per session. All right. And a session is typically an hour. After an hour, the session drops. So I'm thinking that's reasonably cost effective, hey? Five cents per session per user. And that's the new pricing model that will commence from 1st of September. All right. So just the basics. You provision a Power BI workspace collection. You may as, add as many workspaces as you like. You may push Power BI desktop files as data sets up there, and then you may embed them into your applications. Okay, so that's the pricing discussion that I just gave you. Oh, you will get 100 sessions free per month, but then every other session will be five cents US. And the session ends when either the user closes the report or one hour after the session was initiated, whichever comes first. All right, I am just over time, so I'm going to quickly wrap up with a summary and then I'll welcome any questions offline, but I'll need to let the next presenter set up. I gave you an overview of Power BI. It is an evolving story from Microsoft delivering a service in the cloud to deliver BI to a wide audience, pros, analysts, general users. The two licenses, free versus the pro, let's just take a quick look at this matrix. So data cap capacity is the big one. 10 gigs if you're going to pay, 1 gig if you're free. When it comes to refresh, hourly, max eight times a day versus once a day if it's free. From a streaming point of view, when we push with the API, up to a million rows an hour versus 10,000 rows. The other things that stand out, publish to web is available for free. I think that's really, really quite generous. Developer opportunities, let's finish on this note. Well, develop what you need with the service. Use the REST API to create, manipulate data sets, push data to deliver real-time results in dashboard tiles, but also to integrate those reports and dashboard tiles into apps as well. Integrate Power BI with Azure Data Services. The big compelling story is Stream Analytics. You can also use machine learning functionality with Stream Analytics to pass prediction results also to Power BI. Extend beyond the built-in visuals by customizing and adding them to your own solutions. And then finally, the new service that's designed to embed Power BI functionality for applications, not for individuals or groups. All right, lots of resources. The blog is a great place to stay up to date. And believe me, it is changing at a rapid rate. The service has weekly updates, and Power BI Desktop gets monthly updates. There's a developer center specifically for Power BI. Uh, and uh, the growing story is such that Microsoft now want a full day content with a developer audience to teach them the skills required to leverage all that I've just described. That pretty much is the note that I'd like to finish on and to encourage you that if you haven't done so already, sign up for Power BI, it's free. And on that note, I will thank you for your time, attendance and interest and I'll welcome questions offline. Thank you.